And good evening and welcome back to PerfWeb webinar series. This is our webinar number three. I am your host, Joe Basha. And first and foremost, I want to thank you all for your continued support in making PerfWeb your number one perfusion education hub. We would also like to remind you that every one of our shows, broadcasts, webinars, have been approved for Category 1 CEUs by the ABCP. Please refer to our website, perfweb.us, for a list of ABCP approved webinars for webinar registration and for the amount of Category 1 CEUs awarded to each of our programs. As you know, our programs are free for everyone to watch. You only pay if you need the CEU certificate. We want your participation. We want for all of us to learn together. Also, please give us a few days to email you your certificate. We will email them to the email address that you use to register with. Teleprompter's going slow. Okay, click the red subscribe button now and become a part of our Perf Web family. The red subscribe button is right here. Next, click the bell icon next to the subscribe button to receive notifications and updates. We are constantly working on improving the end user experience. For those colleagues that cannot make it to a meeting, for whatever the reason may be, as is seen here on our flyer, which hopefully you receive this in the mail, will or should be able to, will be able to, should be able to acquire all of their ABC uh, P required CEU right here with us. As of now, we have two ways for you to participate and have an interactive experience. The first is the YouTube chat feature. The YouTube chat feature is found on the right side of the broadcast. And if you happen to be watching this in full screen mode right now, you do need to exit full screen mode. And when you do, the chat box will appear on the right. You also must have a Gmail email account. So please, during the commercial break, if you don't already have one, go and get that Gmail account. All that we ask is when you chat with us, or even if you call, please tell us your name, what you do, and where you are from. I'll be monitoring the, uh, you, you, the uh, YouTube chat during the broadcast as I'm doing now on this computer. We also have a dedicated phone line, which is here, and it is accessible during the broadcast when we announce that the phones are open. The number is 281-738-7906. So if you have a good question or want to make a comment or be part of the conversation, please call in and be live on the air. But please, again, wait until we announce that the phone lines are open and you see that notification. If I can't answer because someone else is on the line, the phone rings busy or it goes to voicemail, try again. Or I may even call you back. When you call, it's very important, turn the volume down on the device you are watching the broadcast from. There is a normal 20 to 60 second delay over the web, and if your volume is turned up, it will become very distracting. Your call will be live, but the viewers will hear you around 20 to 60 seconds later. Welcome to our show again. I'm your host, Joe Basha, and I would like to introduce what is, I think, a very esteemed a panel for this evening's program, which is going to be about ECMO utilization and usage and also strategies for providing ECMO coverage. It's a real hot, it's a very provocative topic, I believe. But immediately to my right is Rodell Ebus. Rodell has been a perfusionist for over 15 years. He was uh, up in Detroit at a uh, site that was a clinical uh, site and was an instructor uh, at that uh, place, has a lot of experience teaching students, and also has currently a lot of experience with ECMO here in Houston. I think the students that you taught were from Rush and from Ohio State. Ohio State, that's right. And then Patrick, 
Uh, I think you all remember Patrick. You might remember Rodell from our first broadcast when he was yelling to Stephanie, his wife, that her <laughs> ad was on. If you, if you didn't, go watch that, that one. I think you'll get a big kick out of episode. that. The second episode. It was the second, second episode. episode. Patrick O'Toole has been a perfusionist for about 15 years as well, 20, almost 20, 20 years. 20 years. Now, he did spend a little bit of time in industry, which I think gives him a very unique perspective. But Patrick also ran a perfusion contract service uh, practice up in the Chicago area. And uh, so I think he has some unique perspectives from that in terms of understanding staffing from being here with the amount of ECMO that we're seeing here in the Houston area, and uh, as well with his experience in industry. And we have a guest panelist, a really special guest panelist with us tonight, Chris Loosby. Chris is a graduate of Texas Heart Institute. He went from there to Methodist, currently is at Memorial, graduated from his training in about 2011. And because of the amount of ECMO that we see here in the Houston area, from back, I guess when you really were graduating in 2011 mm -hmm. with the H1N1 epidemic and now just recently with the H2N3 epidemic that, we're, that we've seen. I don't know if it's over yet or not. It seems to be trailing off. But he sees anywhere from one to eight ECMOs every single day. So he has, of all of us, probably the most extensive contemporary ECMO experience of anybody. So we're really excited about the show tonight. I think it's going to be a terrific program. We're looking forward to your calls. Remember, please wait until I let you know that the phones are open. Use the Yahoo chat. I mean, the, not Yahoo, but the YouTube chat. Um, and I'll do my best to kind of monitor that. In the meantime, I'm going to go forward with my presentation, the title of which is ECMO Usage Will Continue to Rise. So I want you to take a look at this picture. And wh what do you see? Well, you see some police you see this SAMU, which just happens to be an EMS service. Um, you see a train. Um, so I'm assuming they're in a train station. Uh, this girl over here has a rather peculiar look to her. She's sort of smiling. She's wearing gloves. I can't tell if the smile is, is humorous or if it's just from exhaustion. It's kind of hard or stress. It's hard for me to tell, but it's kind of an interesting picture because there's a lot of activity going on in this area here. Kind of give you a little bit better flavor of what's going on here. This looks like an art gallery. It happens to be the Louvre uh, in Paris. And if you look here, you can see that there's some really nice paintings. Um, in addition to that, you see over here uh, in this uh, image, a person holding a big bag of fluid. Uh, you look over here and you see this guy on the left holding a light. Uh, you see these two fellas here, which sort of look like they're getting ready for their photo opportunity for the calendar photo shoot. Um, and then you've got this happening over here. And look, this, this, this is pretty serious now. We've got people wearing surgical attire. They're wearing gloves. I'm assuming they're sterile. They're wearing surgical hats and masks. This fellow's here is kind of falling down, but there's a lot of surgery happening right here. Now remember, we're at the Louvre. And then this guy looks like he's praying. <laughs> now here's another picture. Here we see this area. That's what I want you to focus on. And again, that looks like there's a lot, there's surgery happening right here. This is very interesting. This fella here, I couldn't help but point him out. Uh, the lights here, and I can see it, it looks a little bit dark here, but he seems to be looking the wrong way. But he's also holding up this barricade here and one over here as well. So I guess they must also have HIPAA in, 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 in Paris. And then here's another interesting picture. Take a look at this. Look at this area right here. This, I want you to focus on this, but then I want you to really focus down here. For all of us that are perfusionists, what does that look like? That looks like a circuit tubing yeah. set to me. Mm -hmm. yeah, circuit that set. looks like an ECMO circuit tubing set. And then there's this fellow over here that just wants to get to the Pringles, but apparently can't get through. <laughs> Well, that's exactly what it is. So this says the results from implementing on-scene ECMO 
has shown a, and I'm trying to read that right there, an increase in survival from 8 to 29 percent with acceptable neurologic uh, outcomes or status. So basically what you just got through seeing is patients being put on ECMO in a train station, in the Louvre, on a street, and in a grocery store. That is amazing that that is what they're doing. Their EMS service has physicians trained in cannulation and in operation of an ECMO circuit to put those patients on bypass. You know, you talk, you look at war, and in war, there's a golden hour, hour for a soldier. If a soldier gets wounded or injured, then they have, they say if you can get them to the, 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 the hospital or the field hospital or what, whatever care they're gonna get within an hour, their chances of survival are much, much higher. This is what they believe. If the patient has refractory cardiogenic shock, put them on ECMO in the street, and then bring them into the hospital. That's, that's pretty remarkable. University of Michigan here in the United States. Not a big fan. I'm a Michigan State guy. I understand that. <laughs> All right, and that's why you looked at me. But the Trojans didn't do well. The Spartans. And, hmm? Spartans. Oh, the Spartans, that's yeah. right. I'm sorry. That's Same right. thing. Oh, clearly. Um, but they, but nevertheless, they are starting a pilot project to do the same thing. They haven't done it yet, but I do believe they plan on doing it, and I do believe they are going to do it. Mm -hmm. Indeed, in the United States, between the years of 2006 and 2011, ECMO usage increased by 433%. And I'm telling you, I don't know about all, my, my esteemed panel, but I'm certainly seeing it. In addition to that, in this uh, 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 article from the seminars in thoracic and cardiovascular surgery, trends in U.S. extracorporeal membrane oxygenated use, uh, use and outcomes from 2002 to 2012. Now, if you look at the center uh, line that looks fairly flat right there, that is the average mortality, which has stayed fairly consistent. And you'll see some narrative about that here in just a second. You look at the dashed line, and that's the yearly mortality. And then if you look at the green line, in 2007, that's the utilization. That is a very, very steep curve. And it looks like post-cardiotomy, cardiogenic shock, and, uh, and uh, uh, acute respiratory failure are the three, with post-cardiotomy clearly dominating in this particular uh, graph of this data. Uh, but I do think that you're going to see a little later on, the expected increase in growth is actually going to come from the acute respiratory failure. But you can look at that and see in 2007, you can see it bumping up. And if you look at the light blue, which is this right here, and you look at 2010 to 2011, that's where we saw that H1N1, and that's where that big right. spike occurred. And then it sort of trailed off from there. But I think we're going to see it go up again uh, in the, uh, when the data comes out moving forward from there. ECMO use has increased significantly starting primarily in 2007 with changing clinical indications but stable mortality rates. That's the narrative that I just talked about from that graph. This study demonstrates that recent ECMO use has increased significantly and with increasing increasingly varied clinical indications. Mortality has remained stable throughout the period of increased ECMO use. The results support further ECMO technology diffusion across the United States and mounting clinical interest to expand ECMO as a salvage platform in increasingly heterogeneous clinical environments. What does that mean? It means they are advocating, they are supportive of putting ECMO patients on ECMO in further and further out community settings and managing them there, transferring them perhaps, but managing them until they can get them transferred. That it's no longer, we just don't have ECMO capability. 
they're suggesting in that, well, that's what I read from it, that this should be far more ubiquitous than it currently is. This, was, this is very provocative, and this really got my attention. Unconventional volume outcome associations in adult extracorporeal oxygenation in the United States from uh, University of Pennsylvania. If you look at the light gray, those are high volume, account, high volume ECMO uh, programs. That's 30 or greater in a year. The dark blue is medium, between greater than six, but less than 30 in a year. And the low volume in the light blue is six or less per year. Now, intuitively, I know what I should expect from this. But this just really caught my attention. The mortality and the length of stay and the duration of the ECMO run was shorter in the lower volume uh, 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 programs than they were in the medium or the high. Completely the opposite of what I would have expected. Now, that could be selection. It could be the higher volume centers are taking patients maybe in more of the salvage category. I mean, there can be a lot of reasons. And the article, though a good article, really didn't clearly state what the reason for this was. So, you know, I, that's my hypothesis as a potential. But I think this is the reason why we are seeing so much more ECMO and why the outcomes with ECMO have improved over all these years. This is just one of many studies that are out there. I didn't want to just throw a whole bunch of studies on there. But predicting survival after, you know, extra post circulation in severe uh, uh, ARDS, and uh, this is a survival prediction or RESP score. And basically, I think what we've gotten really good at is patient selection in time of initiation, at predicting who is more likely to be a survivor. Um, now, I think as technology improves, and I think that's been a big player in this, survival's gotten better, not just based solely on this, but I think that one can't be without the other. So the technology got better, our protocols got better, our understanding of everything that's going on got better, how we select the patients got better, how we're managing them got better, the medications we're using got better, um, the cannulation is better, we have the Avalon cannula, we have the, the uh, what's that one, uh, not cardiac assist, but it's called uh, uh, Tandem Life. The one that goes into the pulmonary artery and, and Protec and Duo tandem lung. That's it, and it and and it almost complete that one almost completely eliminates recirculation. Mm -hmm. Plus, I think our cannulas are smaller than in the old days. We don't we're not right. it's it's a lot better managing coagulation. But I think along with all these technological advancements, we've also gotten to a point of better understanding those patients who do have a chance versus those that have no chance, and that's the only patients that we used to put on ECMO. I think there is, a, well, let me, let me show you this. This is one of these heart string, one of these, one of these heart string pullers, but this is another thing I think that plays Early a role Early February, I had some swelling in my ankle. I didn't really think anything of it. It turns out it was an undiagnosed blood clot. I was at home with my husband. We were watching the Grammys early February, and all of a sudden I blacked out and I started having a seizure. We really had no idea what was happening because I'd been healthy. I was active, young 20-something, and then all of a sudden I was really sick. So thankfully my husband was my first hero, rushed and um, called 911, got an ambulance to come and immediately um, my paramedics decided that they were going to take me to Legacy Emanuel, which was the second hero of my night was taking me to Legacy Emanuel. That's when I stopped remembering anything and apparently I got rushed to the emergency room and in the emergency room my heart stopped four times. Thankfully my emergency room doctor, Dr. Mike Stone, knew exactly what to do, gave me an ultrasound, and found out that the blood clot that had originated in my ankle had traveled up to my lungs and heart, and it became a pulmonary embolism. From there, they got me stable, and I was placed on ECMO right there in the emergency room. 
And from what I've been told, I am the first person in the West to be put on ECMO right there in the emergency room. So I'm very thankful for that. Now we've put patients on ECMO here in the emergency room. Uh, yeah. N not infrequently, not, yeah. not too infrequently. Right. But again, it's, a, it's, it's very different that we are now suggesting that, that it's, 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 it's populating out, putting patients on ECMO in the ED. It's going to eventually populate out to the street. I think this is just going to be the evolution of what we see. So I, I just am convinced that, that, that we are going to uh, uh, see ECMO utilization continue to climb. Uh, and I, I think more significantly than people right now believe, but everybody is saying it's going to increase. It's to what degree and are we really prepared for it? And that's going to be kind of your guys' mm -hmm. sort of thing to discuss here moving forward. Now, the ER doc's name was Mike Stone, so Dr. Or Dr. Stone, that's right, Dr. Mike Stone. So he kept her from having a stone heart, but more importantly, <laughs> Uh, which was great on his part, but I watched the Grammys this year also, and I had a seizure, but I didn't have a pulmonary embolus. So there's also an economic component to this. In this uh, transparency market research, I highlighted what I wanted you to read. The uh, intelligence study has projected the demand in the global ECMO machine market in increment at a, as, at a notable uh, combined a annual growth rate. Combined annual growth rate, that's what CAGR is, of 7.1% during the forecasted period of 2017 to 2022. So a 7.1% growth rate every year for that period of time would be incredible. Yeah. I don't think we're prepared for it. And again, based on modality, the, uh, this market research report segments the global ECMO machine market into veno arterial ECMO, veno venous ECMO, and arterial venous ECMO, and detects, and this was very interesting to me, that veno, veno, ec, veno venous ECMO segment is currently <clears throat> the most profitable providing for a demand share of 47.7% of all ECMO in 2017. There is an economic motivation for ECMO to increase, as well as all of the right. really important things that we, 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 we talk about in terms of saving patients' lives. Right. But we all know that if there's no money, it's not going to happen. And with that, I will say thank you very much for listening to my, for my presentation. And I think we're going to go to a quick ad. And then we're going to get Patrick's, I believe, uh, presentation up. So don't forget, get that Gmail account if you need it. Thank you very much. We'll be right back. Do I have time to go to the bathroom? Yeah, you got time.
You're on. Okay. All right. Welcome back, by the way, everybody. <laughs> All right, so the first thing I want to say is when I started looking into this, uh, the ECMO growth and all that, the first thing I did is I, I used Google, as everybody would do. And uh, what was interesting is the first, the first Google search that you do, if you put in uh, ECMO coverage in Google, you're going to find the first couple of pages is going to be all services that are set up to provide you that if you need it. So there's a business out there, and, and there's certainly a need. And that was what jumped out to me, first of all. But along the way, I found a couple of uh, interesting articles that I'm going to highlight in my talk. And <clears throat> uh, there's two of them. But the first one is going to be about um, the, the financial differences that can happen when you move from ECMO coverage being 24 hours a day being the perfusionist and then moving that to an ECMO specialist. And then the second one will be more about the logistics of what happens when you how do you do this? I mean, what's involved and what are the issues with, with making this sort of a transition? Because I don't think people are ready to just jump right on and do that. So <clears throat> first thing I wanted to say is I looked into ask, I also, of course, and what is an ECMO specialist? So um, I was a little bit weirded out by what an ECMO specialist is, by what uh, ELSO says. And they say that an ECMO specialist is uh, it can be a, a nurse, it can be a respiratory therapist, it can be a medical doctor, and an ECMO specialist could also be uh, other medical personnel such as biomedical engineers or uh, technicians who receive specific ECMO training and have, approved, have been approved by the medical director. So it's pretty much anybody can be an ECMO specialist as long as they've received this training by ELSO. So I, I think that's spooky to me because I think that as a perfusionist we're, we have a, a certain um, nature to, to understand things that we're just involved with as far as pressures and we're just we're used to the profession. Giving that to a biomedical engineer I think would be, would be difficult but this is, this is the standards that are out there and if we're going to reduce the costs and if we're going to attack this growing need, this is something we're going to have to embrace. So I think there's a conversation we can have about that. Do you adv advance the slides, Roger, or do I? You can I? do it here. Oh, you I do. do. Okay. Right there. Yeah. Left nope, the left nope, and right. Nope, the nope, left nope. and right. Left oh, okay. Right. Okay. So <clears throat> speaking about the cost, uh, Jefferson University did a, a, a paper, which was in 2010, and a lot, of a, a lot of other papers quote this because it really showed a huge cost reduction in the, uh, in the ECMO coverage. And these were contract perfusionists that were uh, covering the ECMO. <clears throat> On the, they, they broke their study into a two-year period of time. In the first year, what they did is they had... They, they just tracked what was going on with their ECMO coverage. The, the, total, uh, the total coverage was uh, two years, and they had 74 patients over the two-year period. The first year, they had, um, uh, I can't remember exactly how many they had, but they had uh, about 24 patients in the first year. And the cost of the 24-hour coverage by the perfusionist was uh, $600,000. $600, and their mortality rate was 42%, which is a little bit lower than what we saw earlier with, with Joe's uh, numbers, but, um, you know, not bad. These were all adult. If they had any pediatric cases, they, they threw those out of the study. The, um, <clears throat> the second year, they had uh, transitioned into using ECMO specialists, and they, they had a, a, a cost of only uh, 234000 um, dollars, so they they really decreased their 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 uh, coverage costs, but they did increase their mortality rate as far as what I saw first off in the article when I, when I read it, and they had a 61 percent uh, decrease in costs and then a 17 percent increase in their mortality. That's that's not that's, good. That's not great. That's not good. But there's, yeah. I'm, I'm, I have a feeling you're going to yeah. give us an explanation yes. for that. Well, <clears throat> the reason I, I wrote the slide that way was otherwise, to, to you talk about tell that. Us, otherwise, yeah, right. you better tell us that they abandoned this project. <laughs> right. <It's> gonna, <laughs> yeah. And I, so. Well, it always comes down to. I mean, uh, do, do you do you you know if 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 you can correlate that there's an increased mortality with perfusion being removed from from the the management of the circuit, you know. 
but the cost is huge, but we're going to continue to have this increased number of patients on ECMO. How do we, you know, how do we deal with that? Who makes that decision? And it, 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 it really isn't us that makes that decision, but it's something we should look at. But there is a little bit more to the, to the story. Mm -hmm. So um, the, uh, just so we can cover the basis of what, of what, what the, the uh, article con continues to describe is that uh, the end on the first year, which was the, the year that they had the perfusionist covering, the ACMO was 12, and then the mortality rate the next year, the end was, was 27. And the p-value was 0.233. I'm sorry, uh, point, uh, yeah, 233. But if you really look, if you read the article and you really look at the details of, of what kinds of patients they were covering between year and one, two, year one and year two, on the second year, uh, the first year, a lot, very few of their, well, percentage-wise, very few of their patients were actually uh, high-risk patients. So most of them were, were other kinds of patients, a lot of venal venous ECMO patients. But what the big change was between the first year and the second year and what really affected their mortality rate was the risk that the patients, uh, the, the, the mortality risk of the patients that they were covering. So on the first year, they had, um, I believe it was, it's hard to see, but 20, 20 patients. See, you need glasses too. Yeah, I know, I do. You, sure recommended, you actually recommended I read this paper, which I did. And uh, I saw the same thing you did at first was, oh my God, this 17% yeah. increase in mortality is horrible. We can't allow this to happen. But delving deeper into the study, basically they had a, their increase in number from the total, from the, 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 what was the original 12 and then the 24? 12 and 24, that's that, right. Right. Almost all of that increase from year one to year two were patients in cardiogenic shock. Right. So and that's a higher risk patient. different animal, right. And I think that's what, that's, that's why that number was what it was, but it was also not statistically significant. So, right. you know, you sort of have to accept that. So they haven't abandoned this program, I take no, it. No, no, they're, they're going forward because their cost saving was, was really significant. Yeah. And, um, you know, there, there were no actual citations of incompetence of the person who was running the ECMO machine. Their issues, their, changing, their changes in mortality were, were really related to the kinds of patients that they were treating during that mm. second year, which mm. was higher. They had more people who were in cardiogenic shock who had a higher mortality. Right. Now, and, and, and I hope you don't mind if I, if I just sort of throw these things out, you know, but s there were no citations of it. Now, there may not have been any pump disasters, ECMO circuit mm -hmm. disasters, where a perfusionist not being there, they weren't able to manage it. So that wasn't the cause of any of these deaths that they, that they said or mentioned. However, I don't know that I can say just because they had higher acuity patients that that somehow would have no impact if it was a biomedical engineer with zero clinical experience. I mean, you know, you have 20 years, you have uh, 10 years, you have 17, you 15, 17 years. You know, I have, I'll just go ahead and say it, 39 years. Um, I've seen a lot of, we've all seen a lot of stuff. It's what we do every day. Um, I don't know that you can translate that into an ECMO specialist, the, the, the years of experience we have in the operating room with everything that we deal with. So, you know, I don't know. I, I, I don't know that I can 100% agree. Well, I would, I would, <clears throat> excuse me, I'd have to agree with you as well. Um, basically because how would you document that? You know, at the end of the day, it's not going to be documented that the ECMO specialist wasn't paying attention or the ECMO specialist didn't do something. Or maybe just didn't know, know have Ooh. correct feel or, 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 or really appreciate the nuance of maybe something that was going on, Absolutely. the dual circulation phenomenon or whatever. There, there's multiple factors that would be, play into this that from what the article says, it doesn't show. I mean, again, anybody can be intelligent enough to run these devices, but again, our profession is the one that, that is solely what you do. You translate that from the operated room to now to the bedside. Uh, again, nurses, respiratory, physicians even, do they learn about this? Yes, but that is not their main focus. And so something that I may see, you know, if all I know is ECMO and heart-lung bypass, um, that, that I would feel that I would catch something before somebody else. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not, again, not saying that I'm better or worse than anybody else, but I feel that the perfusionist should be there. Uh, and again, I don't know how they would translate if 
a respiratory therapist didn't catch something. Right. Didn't see something that could have been addressed much sooner. And I think that is a very real question. We can we can talk more about that. I didn't mean to interrupt you. That's okay. Mind. No, that's great. So what, what happened in this, uh, the way they did handle that is they had a perfusionist available, uh, actually 24 hours for the first 24 hours, they had a patient, they had a, a perfusionist bedside, and then that perfusionist would step back, and this was, the perfusionist did the cannulation. Um, mm -hmm. They would step back after that, and they would move towards um, just being available. They weren't in-house all the time, but they would be available to answer questions and also be within call distance to come in and, and you know, mm -hmm. handle a situation if it, if it got some, to be something that- And the, they did uh, also the call for circuit changes. So they, did the the did the they did the circuit changes. They did the they did the initiation of the of the uh, of the bypass. They did the circuit changes, and they did daily rounds. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, they saved a lot of money. So mm -hmm. I mean, that's oh, I, mean, I, think, I think that's in, in the interest of the hospital. If we, if we want ECMO to grow, and if we as perfusionists want to be a part of that, you know, we, we can't come to them and say, well, we're going to cost you a lot of money, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. We've got to come to them and right, say. But then, yeah, go ahead, Chris. No, I was going to say, I, was, I don't look at it from a cost standpoint. Yes, I know you always have to crunch numbers for these things. That's how the world works. But I look at outcome. That's, that's my first and foremost. I don't go in there because essentially, even though we say, uh, well, how much is that going to cost? You know, we don't go in when somebody has CPR or their patient is down and we need to put them on emergent ECMO. We don't go to their face sheet first. That's not what I do. I've never done that. You don't. You right. go in there and you see that their saturations are in the 30s or they have no arrhythmia and we're trying to get a pulse and we're trying to get access. Right. That's what we do. So that's how I look at these and that's why I see the difference uh, for a perfusion at the bedside versus, say, respiratory. Look at it from this perspective. They, when you have such a device that is required, you need somebody to run that for that. I mean, that, why not cross train and have us run the ventilator? Same concept that is such a specific device that you have a technician, clinician that runs the ventilator. Right. Physicians know about it, nurses know about it, but at the same time, you leave it up to that person. And if you're in a hurry to set these things up, the patient really is coding. They're doing active CPR on these patients. Correct. They're trying to shove cannulas in there. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm a perfusionist and I have almost forgotten, has anybody given the heparin? Correct. So, you know, it's, it's, right. it's, uh, it's a madhouse in there, and it's just that kind of experience that, uh, that, that, that can make a significant difference. Mm -hmm. Sorry again. No, no apologies. Um, that, was the first, that was the first study that, that, I, that I, you know, looked at. Uh, the next study that I have involves more of the, these, <coughs> and by the way, this first group was, uh, the, the Jefferson study involved uh, contract perfusionists, and they, they made, I, I think I can go back a couple slides here and, and show you their financials. There we go. So the first year, uh, they, they ended up billing $600,000 for their, their services, and that involved setting up the ECMO circuit, 24-hour uh, coverage, and then also, um, well, just everything that, that was involved with ECMO. There was nobody else involved, just mm -hmm. the perfusionist, which is what we do as a business. And mm -hmm. it's, it can be taxing on the, on the perfusion it's service. It's horribly, it's yes. horribly taxing on the staff. It's, it's, it is, uh, mm -hmm. it, 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 it's stressful, yeah. um, especially when you have multiple ECMOs in multiple hospitals. But I will say this, and I think that for anybody that may be watching out there, I, I want to make this point. You see that number of 600,000. That doesn't mean that the company that is providing the clinicians to that hospital made $600,000 because that is going to pay salaries of people to be there in the room to do this. So and supplies. what you're saying is the nurse at the bedside um, or some other person, ECMO specialist hired by the hospital is going to be in the room or maybe even hired by the contract company. That could happen too, the contract service. And it's just that that's the cost to the hospital. That's not necessarily the profit to the ECMO service because you don't work for free. No. I don't work for free. I and certainly don't. You, you certainly, certainly don't. don't. And, uh, you know, you're the only one who's ever volunteered for that. Gotcha. <laughs> All right. Can we cut that part? All right. So, <laughs> so um, but, yeah, so the, the, 
that's, that was the billing. This was a study of the billing. It wasn't a study of, of the, they don't know what the contract company made from, right. you know, well, as, I'm just as far as, as profit, a, as a, but yes, as, that I'm was just the telling billing. you, as a person who owns a service that yeah. provides this kind of thing, people look at these numbers and go, oh my God, you know, look at how those people are making yeah. just ridiculous amount of money. But, you know, and, that's, 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 you know, maybe, maybe for profusion is salary. Yeah. And if you yeah. have a 24-7 coverage, that means you're going to have a minimum of needing three perfusionists to do that. You could do it with 12 if they just don't ever want a day off and they just want to do 12-hour right. shifts for, for however long they have to until the ECMO is completed. Mm -hmm. But this sounds like a busy ECMO program. So you have to have a bare minimum of three. Right. So and there's, really, there's really, from a company perspective, it is a lot less financially rewarding than people would imagine. But it is such a critical service to provide that to not provide it would mean you would not have a business at all for doing the hearts and everything else. And, I, and, and I, let me just add to this if I can. I, I've gone through this in some of the discussions that I've had with large university type hospitals like this where I'm trying to negotiate some kind of, a, of, a, of an agreement. And one of the things I hear all the time is that your competitors only want the meat off the bone. They don't want any of this other gristle that's over here with this ECMO stuff. They want to come in and do all the hearts and they don't want to mess with the ECMO at all. Or if they are going to do it, they're asking for a retainer, which makes it cost prohibitive. And these hospitals are taking a big step back and saying, we, 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 we simply cannot afford it. You can't keep providing the service. We, we, we are clinicians first. I mean, and I Correct. think that is different. We're, not, we're all not administrators here at this table. I mean, right. I'm a clinician first. Been practicing perfusionist for 39, almost, well, I'm in my 39th year. So that is my passion is patient care, making sure that I'm, I'm doing the right thing for the most vulnerable amongst us in that circumstance that they're in. But I also recognize that if the organization, whether it be the hospital or my company, is not financially sound, then it, 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 it doesn't work. It folds. It falls apart. And the service that you're providing becomes very substandard. Mm -hmm. So I do think we have to be uh, uh, sensitive to this issue of finances. It's how can we provide the highest quality of service for the most economical price, the best value for the best price. And, and that is the, the, the never ending struggle every organization has, whether it be a hospital or whether it be a service like mine. Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> it is interesting that you would mention retainer because the way this contract perfusion company structured, my, my, I, I imagine that the, the hospital came to them and said, look, we want to we wanna do more ECMO, but we can't pay this price. Uh, it's, it's too expensive. And remember, on this study, on year one, uh, we had 24 patients. On year two, we had uh, 48, so almost, almost double. Right. Whoops, lost my... Right, and we don't know how long they were on ECMO, were they, were they right. month long? <coughs> well, on. well, the average was five days. Five days, yeah. well, okay. So that so was they the had average. some that went in and came out right away and then others mm -hmm. that might have lasted. Well, you know, one thing this, it, it's not mentioning here though, there's a few things. Really everything's a matter of perspective, especially from a hospital standpoint. While I'm a, not an administrator, you're looking at it when you first read it and you say, man, that costs $600,000. There's no mention of what their reimbursement was mm -hmm. to say, yes, it cost $600,000, but the hospital's revenue was $1.5 million. So now they only had, you know, seven, dollars $800,000 profit they made. Well, that's not necessarily profit <clears throat> because they still have to have the lights on. They still have to have the nurse at the bedside. Correct. They still have to have but the from, therapist. From an ECMO standpoint, right. all I'm saying is, yeah, it cost $600,000, but you have perfusion around the clock. You didn't lose money. And I'm not saying they did or didn't, but because it doesn't mention it, it's just out there. Mm -hmm. You didn't lose money, but now you've offered the most extensive health benefit to a patient that's known right now, technology. I mean, you are keeping somebody alive beyond what their organs are saying to do. For $600,000, 42% of that patient population is still alive. Yeah, with very good, well, even sometimes more than that. I mean, 40 to 60%, depending on Well, I'm just going according to their article. It all depends yeah. on their program. 
But now, having said that, now you're saying, well, if we use somebody to wash the machine for you, yeah, we're, we may lose a few more people, but man, you cut your cost by this much. So now it's really what is important to you. But one thing also they didn't do, and they're just monitoring this program, is what I foresee happening and going along with what you were saying and what you were saying is, I don't know necessarily that they're going to be doing this on the street corner, but my next guess would be that you're going to train ER physicians to look for it and know when it's going to be viable. And they may have one circuit in the hospital and they're going to have programs that are sister programs that they're going to say, hey, John, we got an ECMO patient. Great. They're going to put them on ECMO. Then the major center is going to come pick them up, fly them up, and offer the best of the abilities because that's one thing that they're known for doing. Mm -hmm. And so now your community hospital saved the life, used the service, and is not taking the big hit on it. That's mm -hmm. what I foresee the future is. Yeah, as long as they keep them a certain amount of time because of the reimbursement structure of CMS and all that stuff, that's, that's I don't very, see anybody on very ECMO. confusing. Yeah, I don't see but, anybody on ECMO uh, for a few days and, it, and seven days later they're home. Right. It's usually a right. lengthy stay whether they're on or off. Right. But uh, I do foresee that's the way it's going. I think, I think you're probably right. But I, I'm going to be real provocative here just, just for the sake of being provocative. I don't do it often, but I want to do it just for this one time. I've also seen where there's some nurses who I think are way better at managing an ECMO than some perfusionists. Correct. Not as a rule, but I have certainly seen those exceptions. Correct. Especially in places where a person's been there for the past 15, 20 years, never did an ECMO, gets an ECMO patient. And the next thing you know, they have them on ECMO with the heart-lung machine in the ICU with a reservoir on top of yeah. it. And they're trying to roll the patient to CT, and the pump has to go downhill, and they're, mm. they're, they're, pump, they're, really? they're draining huh. the aisle. I've seen that happen several times. It, it's very frightening. Um, so, you know, uh, I, I, think we need to, uh, I think we need to do a better job at, at helping our colleagues be part of this conversation mm -hmm. and all of us, you know, sort of collaborating. I don't think we do such a great job with that, but that's another topic for another day. I think it's, some, I think, I think it's something we need to do better. Um, and you have somebody <clears throat> here with us, right? And yeah, that's for, our, that's for our next paper. I never next untr paper. introduced our, our guest that's going to be on spot. Okay, well, sure, I'm, but I'm let, me, let me just mention, I wanted to point out how this contract perfusion company structured this transition. Because on both of the papers that I am presenting, uh, it, it's about a transition from, from having perfusionist 24-hour coverage to, uh, to, to you know, ECMO specialists. Mm -hmm. And one is from a contract company and one is from in-house perfusionists. So mm -hmm. this particular contract company, well, the way they structured it is they said, okay, you want to reduce your costs. What we'll do is we will charge you a, a retainer of $234,000 per year. And for that retainer, what we'll do is we will train people in your hospital to be ECMO specialists, and we'll do that yearly. And we'll put the ECMOs in, and we'll provide eight to, I think, I believe it was eight to 12 hours of ECMO coverage for the first uh, part of it to get them stabilized. And then they'll back off, and they'll come mm -hmm. by once a day. And that was their charge. So how, I, I'm thinking in a, in a from a, being somebody who's been a contractor and working for a contract company, if you could go to a hospital and say, rather than the expenses that you're incurring, we'll charge you this retainer, and we'll do as, as you could grow your ECMO program as big as you want. We'll mm -hmm. handle it for this same capitated price. Mm -hmm. They'd say yes. Well, I will tell you. Would this. you agree? <laughs> well, I'm, I don't know. Maybe, perhaps. I mean, some hospitals. I've I've heard some hospitals tell me well, we cannot have our nurses running this because we would then have to change their job description and that is an extremely <clears throat> yeah. complex thing to do. Yeah. But then you get into this argument of, well, how come in certain cities at hospitals, the all of the pediatric cases are run by nursing, nursing nurse ECMO specialists, but all, the adults can only be run by, by uh, perfusionists. I mean, you know, I mean, I know children aren't aren't little adults, but they're but they're just as it's like I don't get it. There's too much contradiction, and when you get that kind of contradiction, I think that it opens the proverbial Pandora's box where people just decide, I, I, you know, you don't really know, you don't have a handle on this, and we're just going to have to figure it out ourselves. And they usually don't figure it out that well, but they don't recognize you as a as a, as a real expert 
on this because you're talking out of both sides of your mouth. Well, the kids can be run by nurse specialists, but adults have to only be run by uh, perfusionists. And mm -hmm. that doesn't make sense to most people, including me. Well, that's where ELSO comes in. So they have a certification program, which some hospitals are accepting, and people can go and get certified, and some of the hospitals are saying these are the people that can, can operate the ECMO circuit, mm -hmm. which I was spooked out about as well. I mean, that's mm -hmm. why I showed that first slide. <laughs> I'll tell you this. If we don't fix it, if we don't figure out what to do, somebody else is going yeah. to right. fix yeah, it, absolutely. and it's not going to be to our advantage. Yeah, we right. need to be in front we of it. We saw heart surgeons do this with catheter skills, with wire skills. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They lost all of that to cardiologists. Cardiologists have become the all-powerful in the hospital, the gatekeepers to what happens to the patient that comes in with, uh, with uh, 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 ACS, acute coronary syndrome. And w we're going to do the same thing. Correct. Uh, let's move on to the, the next paper that I'm covering. And I have a, a special guest. Her name is Suzanne Osborne. She's a friend of mine. And at the time that this paper was written, she's Skyping in. At the time that this paper was written, she was the chief of perfusion at Emory University okay. Hospital. And so um, while she's not listed as an author of the paper, I know that she was very involved with, with what was going on there as they trans transitioned as hospital-employed perfusionists uh, to backing <coughs> off from covering the ECMO. And so she has a lot of insight. Um, are you on? Can you hear us? Yeah. Oh, yeah. great. OK. Good to see you. Could, could you ask her to lower her, her camera just a little bit so we can, because your chin is cut off. Oh, she can hear me. Oh, perfect. Oh, that's much better. There's the hey, whole Suzanne. There's the whole person. We had yes. Suzanne from yes. up. We have the yes. whole person now. Got the whole thing. Okay, good. So um, in the paper that I read that, you know, that, that was published from your hospital about this transition, a couple of things jumped out, jumped out to me, and I was thinking that maybe you could talk about some of the, uh, some of the points. The first one is uh, they, they really, in, they, they really uh, emphasize the importance of institutional commitment to the transition and the coverage. Can you talk about how that was and how the institution was involved with, with this transition? So before we started the transition, we didn't have a uh, ECMO position. Our chief of um, anesthesiology decided to recruit someone from the University of Michigan, an attending a full care position uh, from U of M to come down. So we actually um, had meetings prior to him actually joining the physical team. But it was a complete interdisciplinary uh, a team um, from, from nephrology to pulmonology to cardiac anesthesia to regular anesthesia. Um, to the CEO, the, uh, the nurse educator of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the unit, of course, and the respiratory therapist director. So um, it also helped that our actual CEO uh, was a prior RT, so that kind of helped, helped uh, the whole thought process um, uh, go along a little bit smoother than, um, than it would normally. So, uh, go ahead. Well, what about the physician leader? Was what was their particular role and how how they were involved with with the transitions and the ECMO management? So we actually physically had to write uh, policies and procedures and protocols from the start because we were doing basically ECMO ad hoc prior to prior to uh, uh, this position coming coming down. So we had to do all that from the beginning. Now a lot of them is a lot of them are uh, mirrored off of ELSO and U of M's uh, policies and procedures and guidelines. So that helped. Um, that helped with that process. And you 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 did the train. ELSO did the training for the perfusionist. I mean for the ECMO specialist, or did did your group? No. So we um, we are or were a remote cannulation. Uh, center. So what happens is the perfusionists go out and physically get the uh, patients, That's either by air or by yeah. ambulance. And we, or Emory is a, a, a four cardiac hospital, 
but other hospitals growing and, you know, one of the largest centers um, in the southeast. So, um, so yeah, we, the, the perfusionists actually were the individuals that flew um, and, and, and get the patients. But in the training, we actually sat with the RTs, because it's an RT-driven program, kind of mirrored off of U of M's program. Um, we sat uh, with RTs for two 12-hour shifts and then gave them an actual competency test, um, both hands-on and physically written. Um, and this was after their, because we used the cardio help, this was after their five-hour comprehensive cardio help training, along with a, I think it's two-day training. Um, it was originally with an individual from Eggleston uh, across the street, but uh, since then our, well, now he's the chief uh, of perfusion there and now uh, teaches that course. So what was the biggest you had institutional buy-in for sure because they wanted to reduce uh, the perfusionist time commitment. And I know that also it mentioned in the surgery that there was uh, there were actually delays in, in surgery because you had perfusionists that couldn't go and operate the heart-lung machine because they were, they were held up doing uh, ECMOs. Um, right. So you had the institutional buy-in probably for that reason. And then also, uh, you, you did the training of the respiratory therapist, the perfusionist right. did that, and you had a kind of a sign-off sheet. Um, was there something else, Joe, that you were gonna mention? No, I had a question on the, uh, on the uh, YouTube chat, but I don't Oh, go ahead, go, go, for, it. No, no, no. go for it, let's, hit the, let's take the question, that'd be oh, good. Oh, okay, so, so let, me, let me ask you, the, can I see that sheet? Sure, sheet. you may not be, it's very small. That's, that's okay. <laughs> um, so, now, Suzanne, are you still at Emory? No. No. Okay. I am not. Okay. So the, the question, let me ask this first question from John Ingram, and uh, John is a perfusionist, and he is asking that we spend years obtaining our CCP, our Certified Clinical Perfusionist, um, and months obtaining a state license in those states that have individual state licensure, only right. to arrive at an ECMO coverage job to find that ECMO specialist is uh, managing the patients uh, and they have neither. And, and I have to say, Suzanne, and I, I, I definitely uh, understand the paradigm, but what you described as the training, though I am confident you and your team while you were there at Emory probably put a tremendous amount of work into training RTs to do this um, I mean, they have zero hemodynamic monitoring skills. Um, they have zero understanding of, you know, of fluid uh, uh, compartment fluid shifts yeah. and, 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 and acid, ba well, they might understand acid base balance, yeah. but electrolytes and, and, and lactate and, and hypoperfusion syndrome. And, and yeah, they get a two-day course and they're an ECMO specialist. That and seems, I, no. that Emory doesn't seem right. Is, Emory is a teaching institution. It's, it's critical care medicine, 24 hours a day, including um, uh, EICU, mm -hmm. which is, uh, uh, you know, monitored with a camera and uh, remotely monitored um, uh, with nurses and physicians, critical care physicians. Um, our ECMO director could probably run, run to the hospital quicker than um, parking at the hospital. He was that close. Um, we were on call and could be called at any, any time. And knowing that Emory, you know, Emory is a, uh, a heart, lung, um, and bad center, we were in house probably mm -hmm. out of 24 hours a day, probably 20 hours of the, the the day. Yeah, and Suzanne, I, and I hope I didn't come across poorly. I, I definitely am not uh, trying to, 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 to put you on the defensive of justifying this. I, I'm, I'm really just trying to wrap myself around. I, I just don't think, I just, just simply do not feel, regardless of all of those other variable accoutrements that you just described, that it is adequate for someone given the amount of training that we all do, including yourself, that right, they can right. run an extracorporeal blood circuit that has a 
artificial heart, an artificial lung, a heater, a, a, a heating, a heater cooler element to it, or, or, or a. What am I trying to say? Well, I have a question. Well, I, here's my question. Yeah. And, Since and they're somebody two days, they're uh, they're they're right. qualified. I think that's, I don't, I don't that, wanna... that that baffles my mind. A nurse, I can kind of understand it. A nurse, mm -hmm. I sort of can because they at least they understand all of these things that happen to these are complex patients with anticoagulation right. mm -hmm. how much anticoagulation training does a respiratory therapist get in the respiratory therapy training i, I don't think any and we, again i'm not we, meaning we, to seem overly no, passionate I, i'm just shocked I, I i i don't disagree with you but i also think this is a conversation that probably should have been should have should have occurred 40 years ago or 30 years ago when 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 uh, everything started up here at the University of Michigan. Yeah, well, yeah, 30 that years ago. I mean, but 30 years ago, 40 years ago, definitely the mortality rate was 99.99999. Yeah. 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 The only one that survived was the right. one that they couldn't get the ECMO in. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, right. you know. Right. So There's a lot there, of things wrong with the University of Michigan. But, the other side you know. of it, there has been, you know, numerous things that perfusionists have given up well that's because true of, i can't oh, argue right. that you're well, right you're right I mean, about and, that and we're in this world today that we have personnel problems yes um, now, although we don't have enough of us so we and we're confronted with a big problem i agree with you i have, right. a, I have a question suzanne how often um because do you know how often somebody as a perfusionist was called in if there was somebody in house to, to give help or was it pretty easy for those respiratory therapists to just take this over um we, we, the director of respiratory therapist put stipulations out of how many people on his team were going to be trained initially. Uh -huh. So only uh -huh. the individuals He's that had X amount of experience and wanted it and, you know, had the, um, uh, had, had a bachelor's degree also. So, um, <clears throat> I, I felt like they grasped, grasped grasped it very well. Most of them were, during their training, were asking very appropriate, uh, very good questions. Um, you know, they're used to the ventilator. They're used to lungs. They're used to um, that type of thought process. Yes, you had to teach them a little bit of, of heparin knowledge, anticoagulation knowledge, hemodynamic knowledge. Um, but again, it's, it, it's about a team. And they're, you know, they were the individuals that were physically sitting, uh, you know, in front, in front of the pump. But they had a team of very knowledgeable individuals around them, either in, you know, the unit or by phone. And, and to answer your question, Patrick, I had to troubleshoot um, over the phone uh, a, a situation, and I was able to do it. Um, but I would say out of... What, what 20, 2014, I think, is when this paper was written. Um, you know, out of the three years I was there, there was maybe a half, a half a dozen times that we were either called in or or called in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. Now, mind you, we rounded before we left. We were in the hospital a lot of the times. And, you know, if something need, needed changed out, we were there. Um, but, again, that was... I would say 95% of the time during normal working hours. So. so the paper doesn't really mention mortality rate, and that kind of came up in our last paper. Um, right. Are you aware of any changes? Did you, if from your, Because it wasn't part of the paper, just from your feeling, do you think that, that it was uh, worse or not <laughs> after, um, after this transition happened? Uh, no, we were doing it very ad hoc, and and... You know, this paper was written after we had stipulations on, on the patients we would take. Mm -hmm. um, now, mind you, the thought process was also um, because we had an established program, uh, right. we would go out and get some of the patients that probably might not do well at a center that, um, you know, didn't have an established program. So we felt, you know, the borderline patients that we might not take because of you know the uh, their um, their issues, we would take those from an outside center because they had a better chance of survival at our place that had 
policies, procedures, and um, guidelines on how we did stuff. Mm -hmm. Sure. So. Mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. I would agree with that. Okay. Agreed. Yeah, I think that makes sense too. Of course, then that that becomes that's another that's a whole nother topic, you know, in right. terms of centralization versus not. Should mm -hmm. should these other hospitals only insert, stabilize, and then ship them? Should they keep them and take care of them? You've got uh, control issues and ownership issues and well, logistical issues and mm -hmm. all of those mm -hmm. other things that go along with that. So you know, it's a so, so if I can ask that same question Patrick did, only I want to ask it in a different way. Mm -hmm. With it all being said, did you feel that the patients were receiving the same level of care with the ECMO specialists, respiratory therapists versus the perfusionist, or did you see any difference in the quality of care given to the patients from an ECMO management perspective if it was a respiratory therapist ECMO specialist versus a nurse ECMO specialist? It was never a nurse ECMO. Oh, it never was, was, it, was, it went study. from perfusion <laughs> to, unless I'm uh, wrong, it, so was, it went from perfusion was, to respiratory therapist. So up till, uh, I want to say about, uh, it was probably about a year ago, they, because of staffing issues, um, they decided to allow some nurses to be trained also. Okay, so it is happening. Okay, okay. so I think that's. Well, that was a yeah, good I'm personally, yeah. I'm just more comfortable. Well, I love initial. respiratory therapists. I've just, I've just happened to be right. more comfortable with nursing mm -hmm. uh, yeah. that have ICU experience. I just think they understand. That's just my opinion. Doesn't mean that I'm right, but intuitively, it seems like it, it makes sense to me. But anyway, um, okay. Uh, do we, do we want to? Well, Did I have, have, I have one. There's, there was one thing that was sort of nebulous in the paper, and I'm not, I don't know if you know anything about this, but they said that one of the keys to success was having an outside consultant service evaluate the ECMO candidates. Who was that? I mean, don't tell me who it was, but what, what is that? Did no, you, tell us who it was. It doesn't say. <laughs> well, uh, which That's what it tell says. Us. Right. Could you yeah, tell us yeah. who that is? Well, don't well, tell, no, we just, tell I mean, us. It was just the call would come in to a transfer center. Uh-huh. And the transfer center had, you know, basically a nurse, and they would ask all the questions. Um, and then from there, it would go to a assistant administrator uh, if we had to get a plane and or ambulance um, and the critical care uh, physician on call. So. So there was not some outside consulting service that would say, this is a good perfusion candidate. I mean, this is a good uh, ECMO candidate or not. I thought that was interesting in the paper. Internal. Uh, an internal, internal process. Okay, so, okay, okay. I mean, the transfer yeah. center is probably not uh, employed by Emory Healthcare, but yeah. Hey, we're probably so, going to open it up for calls we, later. We are. And if we do, would you? can you stay on for a little bit in case somebody has a question for you? Sure. Okay. Yeah, we're just going to, yeah, I, hold, hold on. I'm getting, I'm getting yelled at that we're running over, but yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, Oh, don't forget to mute your mic. To mute your mic. I'll do that. Well, if we when we go when we go on commercial, well, if wish. you don't, then uh, then whatever you're doing back there, everyone will hear. And we've already had that experience. Yeah, I wish someone would let me know yeah, that. Exactly. So. Uh, so there you go, Suzanne. Yes. There's your warning. So do you, you don't mind hanging around a little bit because we can we can I think we still need we still have Rodell's talk to give. So um, uh, why don't we do this? Why don't we take a short commercial break? Um, I've got one other point, though, before we go, and I'm, I'm really sorry, but I don't want to miss this. Uh, John Ingram again asked um, that uh, Charlie Reed often asked this question 30 years ago as discussions about giving away ECMO first emerge. The shortage, the shortage has always driven this, but perfusionists should take heed. I think that's very sage advice right there. And he also adds that the final comment is everything is going along fine with a non-perfusionist until it goes wrong. And I think that's a, another very mm -hmm. good point. It all seems easy when it's all just running and going in circles. But when it really does fall <coughs> apart, you know, look, I've been on cases before where the, 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 the femoral arterial cannula has come out. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty dramatic. And yeah. you really do have to react. The patient survived. But you still have to, if you have to react properly and you have to be able to help 
whatever physician, surgeon, or whomever is reinserting that cannula to do it in a way that doesn't later cause even more harm. Right. Yeah. It's, 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 and those, those things happen, and I know they're not common and that they're somewhat rare, but you know, it's, it's like anything in life. You, you only, all of us really only get very few opportunity to really show what we're made of. We get that mm. case or that situation in life. It could be anything where it's your time to act and you're either gonna do it or you're not. Correct. And that's what ends up defining you for a very long time. Okay, so yeah, that's for sure. we're gonna go to commercial break. So everybody, if you would, if, you, if I'd, uh, I think we're gonna come back, do your talk. We are gonna open the phone lines up. I know we're a little late in doing that, but uh, you know, go to the restroom, make a sandwich, get a sandwich, whatever, and we'll see you back here in about two or three minutes. That's all you now. <laughs> Imagine trying to drive a car looking only through the rear view mirror. Critical decisions would be based on old and possibly inaccurate information. 
The same can be true of performing cardiopulmonary bypass without continuous inline blood gas monitoring. Terumo's CDI Blood Parameter Monitoring System 500 continuously delivers 11 critical blood parameters throughout the procedure. With other systems, periodic blood gas measurements provide static information that is helpful but limited. Continuous monitoring tells you what you need to know every step of the way, and that reduces risk. Studies show a direct correlation between blood gas management and reduced complication rates. The CDI System 500 has been earning the trust of cardiac hospitals and cardiovascular surgical teams for almost 20 years. It provides continuous monitoring of 11 of the most critical blood gas parameters, utilizing industry-leading technology. During cardiopulmonary bypass surgery, the shunt sensor can be placed in any arterial or venous shunt or purge line with continuous flow. The shunt sensor uses optical fluorescence technology to measure PO2, PCO2, pH, and potassium in the blood. Four microsensors and a thermistor well are in direct contact with the blood to accurately and rapidly measure the values. Light emitting diodes direct light pulses toward the microsensors, which contain fluorescent dyes. The intensity of the fluorescent light from the microsensors will vary depending on the levels of PO2, PCO2, pH, and potassium in the blood. The photo detector measures and converts the light to numerical data, which is then displayed on the monitor. Blood values are always current with virtually no gaps. There is no need to make difficult judgments about when to draw a sample. Gas source or oxygenator failure can be rapidly detected. Continuous monitoring is especially beneficial during procedures on young or old patients or with smaller perfusion circuits. Peer-reviewed clinical evidence supports the value of continuous blood gas monitoring. Contact your Terumo sales representative for a demonstration or visit terumo-cvs.com. Okay, welcome back. Hope you got a good sandwich and uh, a drink, hopefully some good beer, wine, tequila, whatever's your flavor. We're up with Rodell now, and uh, what's the title of your talk? It is, How Does a Program Survive with a One or Two Man Perfusion Group Doing ECMO? That's, that's tough. Good luck. That, yeah. Yes, Been absolutely. There. So Joe tasked me with this and, you know, it's actually quite difficult because, you know, I've always been part of a great team. Um, whatever I needed to go into, um, I always had a senior perfusionist to take care of, you know, whatever I needed or needed to help me with. So how does a one and two man perfusion group take care of, you know, ECMO? You know, they still have to take care of their heart patients um, uh, as, as, as well. Um, maybe some take care of the cath lab um, with balloon pumps or impellas or things like that. So, and then you add this ECMO in, which we are the specialists. We are the extracorporeal membrane oxygenator specialists, if you will. We are blood propelling, um, VA ECMO, VV ECMO. Um, again, we, we talked about, you know, we know the anticoagulation, we know our membranes, we get to pick our, our circuits. Um, so I wanted to make this a discussion versus me just talking. Um, again, because I've always been part of a team. Should we, should we open the phone lines? We would, I would love to open the phone lines. Why don't we do that? Um, for all of you out there in uh, web world, we're going to go ahead and open the phone lines now. I think Roger's going to put that notification up with the telephone number. So if you'd like to call in, uh, please feel free to call in. And I've got the trusty phone right here. Yeah. It'll take about a minute for everybody that's, out there that's to That's fine. That. Um, we talked about that ECMO specialist um, and, you know, the penchant for it to be the perfusionist. And I understand that. We, that's our expertise. That's what we went to school for. That's what we trained for. That's what we do. That's our primary goal is 
to provide extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, right? And we do it in heart surgery. So we also talked about the ICU nurse. You know, it's, to me, it's all about the education. We talked about it, you know, is two days enough to become that ECMO specialist? I say no, um, but it is a necessary thing. We can't cover, this one and two man perfusion group can't cover these whole things. I mean, I've talked to one and two man perfusion groups and they say, well, that happens in, once in an every blue moon. I send it to my major hospital. I'm a community hospital. I'm going to send it to the hospitals that, that do ca take care of the ECMOs. The big, center, the the big set. The, the, I mean, and that's, that's the standard answer. But that's not the answer we're looking for. How do the single and, and, and two-man perfusion groups Take care of it. Well, I don't think they can. They I mean, can't. I, they, really I mean, can. That's really personally, the they can't. And that's why there are, in, there's an, in fact, Patrick's beginning of his conversation, of his uh, presentation, was that th there are services. There's ProCirca. There's ECMO Advantage. There's several different transport companies that exist. Um, there's, of course, more Herman Life Flight, and mm -hmm. you go and do that. There's what you were doing, Suzanne, over in, uh, at, at Emory. Um, and I think this is, you know, this is commonplace. But, yeah. but I had a question for you. What, and come on now, start calling. You should have heard, got the number by now. Um, anybody, anybody? I got a couple things to. I got a couple Somebody things to say too, as well. Chris, uh, call us. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but let me ask all of you this: How many ECMOs did you do during your training as a perfusionist? I'm going to start with Chris. Oh, I did plenty. Because if we weren't in the OR, um, in that rare occasion where they were slow for some reason, we were back in ICU. Okay, so you did a lot. You had a lot of Correct. training in ECMO. I did nothing until I worked 20 years later for Houston Extracorporeal so, Technologies. Really? So yeah. you had zero ECMO training in your training? Yeah. And but I mean, it's to, intuitive. You went to Rush, right? Training, Where did anyway. you go? Rush you, went, Presbyterian you went to Rush, okay. How many, changed, you were THI. How many I was you THI, but believe it or not, it, it wasn't the popular thing to do. It was, I think I maybe saw one. Mm -hmm. We mm -hmm. saw one. I mean, it was, you know, 2000. But of course, you know, it's, right. I mean, and I recognize that ECMO. And Suzanne, let me ask you, where did you go to school? I went to the Ohio State. The <laughs> Ohio the State University. Ohio. The Ohio. <laughs> How about how about how about the no more Ohio State University I know. School of yeah. Perfusion? And I, okay. And I went twenty mm. years ago and I mean I couldn't I don't recall actually a class or a uh, even a lecture on ECMO. Maybe, you know, maybe an hour or two lecture on ECMO, but I did not see any at all when I was out on my clinical rotations and basically up until, you know, the last six years. Mm -hmm. So uh, well, let me let me being see. An adult yeah, so, so, so really done. Um, done, yeah. you know, right. It, during that time. You're so, with us. So here's the thing, you know, now I had none either, but that's because it hadn't really, I, 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 I you trained. You can say it hadn't I, been invented yet. I, I trained before ECBO. Okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, we actually did it with a, with a, with a dual cola bow. It was pretty. It was Bubble pretty, and oxygenators. It was pretty, no, no, it was a membrane. Okay. It was a membrane. It was very frightening. Mm -hmm. um, because you had, it was, it was, but I don't want to get into that, belabor that point. Um, but, um, but I, I had none either, but I think that two things stick out of my mind. One is I, I think that the ECMO circuit essentially is a mini version of what we do all of the time. So the transition from a technical perspective from perfusion in the OR to ECMO is very easy. I think mm -hmm. the management of the patient on ECMO is vastly different. This is my this is my opinion, my observations. What say you all, Suzanne? Why don't you go first? I agree. I think the management is completely different. Um, you know, heparin management, uh, uh, volume management, uh, mm -hmm. CRRT, of course, comes into um, it, 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 you know, it, it, into it when you're in the unit and you have to get off volume. Um, you know, I didn't know anything about the ventilator uh, prior to, you know, me sitting down and training the uh, 
the RTs. You know, we had the conversation. I learned a tremendous amount about, you know, what they do and why um, for the different modalities and the different patients that they, you know, see outside of the ECMO patient. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, well, luckily for me, I've had the training of both, um, also a respiratory therapist. So coming into perfusion, I just, you know, that was my stepping stone. Um, however, I do think she is right. So, you know, you got to look at it again from perspective as a perfusionist, we run heart lung bypass in the OR. That's us. Anesthesia and the doctors, those guys are in charge. Yes. But during the case, what do we do? Who manages, uh, you know, anticoagulation? We do. Who manages volume? We do. We, now we may say we need blood or we need crystalloid, you know, sometimes some programs let you do it, some don't, but at the end of the day, in the OR, it's you managing it. If it's a good program and they right. respect you, you right. know, and it's a true team, correct. Right. they're going to yeah. at least listen to your rationale. Yeah. Now, they may disagree with you and make a different decision, but it is a collaborative effort. Right, but right. it's such a short time that they're okay with that. Now you move that circuit to the ICU, and in my opinion, to have an authentic, great program, uh, you need to have all teams on board. I mean, you need to have hemopath on there just to manage your anticoagulation and blood product utilization. You need to have pulmonary just to manage your vent settings. Uh, I mean, everybody on board, infectious disease, that's something people take for granted. But mm -hmm. a lot of times when that's on board, no matter what you're doing, is it going to help you if they don't get that resolved? Uh, so to be a legitimate program for the best for the patient, when you're in the uh, ICU, you need everybody on board. Mm -hmm. You can't have, you may have one person steering it because it may be surgical versus pulmonary, but everybody has to be on board. Mm -hmm. Looks like you have to and say in something. The, <laughs> in the unit, you have to have orders for everything. Correct. You have right. to have orders to get 500 cc's of crystalloid. That, it's not like that in the OR. No, absolutely no. not. Yeah. And on top of that, it's, it's easier to give it in the OR, especially in the adult population. Uh, everything is somewhat generic settings. Any of us that are perfusionists, we're all experienced with that. You know, oh, I need some volume, volume's low, let me add some. You go on uh, pump, bypass, whatever you want to call it, generic settings, as long as you're maintaining pressure. Now you translate that to the pediatric population. Any of my PD guys listening, they know, what do you do? what's the first thing you do? You prime your circuit to match your patient. So there is no big shift of anything when you go on bypass. So that also carries over to the ICU. There are no generic settings in ICU. We may be generic as we're doing CPR, putting it in at three o'clock in the morning. But once we do that, we're talking about blood gas, coags, the whole panel to match and do whatever we can for the patient immediately. Mm -hmm. And all teams are on board immediately around the clock. And so to go back to what you were saying, can one or two man team answer that or run that? Absolutely not. They can put somebody on ECMO because we know how to do that. Right. Even as a, just a perfusionist who doesn't do ECMO, you can put somebody on ECMO. However, you can't manage that. If you can't have somebody available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, then you can't manage the program. Go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. No, go. you go ahead. Please. No, I mean, I, I, I totally agree with that. I mean, you know, that's what we train for. That's what we do. That's our domain. I mean, we're not, we're not here to give that up. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I, as a clinician with a good conscience, I want to be there. I need to be there. But can I physically be there? No, you're right. That's the question. And maybe education for that ICU nurse or someone who has that critical thinking skill level, not to say that, you know, RTs don't have it, that ICU nurse, that's her domain. She's not coming into my OR and saying like, hey, no, you, sh you, shouldn't, you shouldn't give that, you know, 200 right. of crystalloid. And I feel that, hey, you should really turn down that neosinephrine or that fentanyl. That's not my domain. That's mm -hmm. her or his domain. Correct. So that's, that's my feeling on it. But I think it should be more of a collaborative discussion. But yes. Don't you think? No, absolutely. I agree. Do but it's not even an issue of that. Do you think we can maybe turn those right. pressures down, especially when they're at, you know, sure. when right. they're what happens when levels. you have high pressure. Now your flows are impeded or so forth. The right. minute you, you put an esmol all on and now their ejection is slowed down, now you're able to flow better. Yes. So there's a lot of limiting factors. Right. But right. going back, it's really even just from a mechanical standpoint, if you can't have somebody there 24, even if you have a specialist there, you still need a perfusionist. Even the, the study right. that you did, you still had a perfusionist available immediately, correct? So if you don't have that available, a one to two man team can't have that available. Even if you have 15 ECMO specialists in your community hospital and you say we can staff the ECMO, but you only have three perfusionists, one's on vacation and there's two scheduled cases in the morning, you can't staff that. Right. So now, now let me be even more provocative if I can. Um, 
is it going to end up being, since you just made the comment, I don't want to give that up, are we going to have to give something up to keep something? Because in the one or two man programs, even with an outside service coming in and watching that patient, how many, you know, I mean, what are they going to do if you don't have, like you said, hemopathology, you don't have pulmonology, you don't have infectious disease that really know what's going on. So should, I mean, do, wh where, who's going to get a handle on this? I, I don't think a one or two man program, I don't even think a four man program should be right. managing ECMO except in an emergency situation to stabilize them and they need to go someplace else. I do frankly believe mm -hmm. in centralization. Absolutely. However, Let's just go backwards, you know, let's go in the Wayback Machine. I just showed you a paper that was, that was done, which was a very, it was a, it was, it was a credible paper that low volume accounts had actually, or low, low volume right. programs, I should say, had lower mortality than mm -hmm. did the higher volume programs. Now, again, mm -hmm. don't really understand why that was, but the data was the data. And mm -hmm. I, I know it can be explained in a lot of different ways, but still, you know, I, I believe in centralization. I don't think small, really small community programs should be managing these, but Memorial is technically, and where we're at in the Woodlands, is technically a community yeah, program. Mm -hmm. Now it's a level right. two trauma center now, so things have changed, but you've got St. Luke's and you have Methodist, right? They're all within that same mm -hmm. area. It's becoming the next medical center. It's gonna be the medical center of the Woodlands. Um, and we don't do nearly as many ECMOs at any one of those places as you do, even combined. But yet I think we, 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 we do enough to, to have happening. very high proficiency, yeah. be really good at what we do. And we have these collaborative mm -hmm. kinds of relationships. If you're in dreary, eerie Pennsylvania, that may not be the case. So mm -hmm. should it really even, I mean, we got to be able to put the patient on just to save their life, but should that program be allowed, and who's going to make that decision, be allowed to keep that patient because they want to keep the patient mm -hmm. just because of whatever the reason may be, pride, mm -hmm. you know, right. uh, being a cowboy, whatever you want to call yeah. it. Um, uh, uh, is that really the right thing to do? And who's going to make those decisions? Mm -hmm. Who's controlling this? Right. Uh, I have a question Go ahead. Um, for you, Joe, because you know more about the, the reimbursement on, on ECMO. Yes. If a community hospital were to put somebody on ECMO, say, post, you know, cardiogenic shock. Yes. They put the patient on ECMO, they collect the fee. Well, you, if, if. What happens if they transfer the patient? What happens to that fee is my question. Yeah, I mean, those are really good questions. So it, reimbursement is a very complex thing, and I am not a reimbursement expert. I want to make sure we're clear on that. But if you come in and you're having heart surgery, four vessel cabbage, and you're, you, you have post cardiotomy and you cannot be weaned from bypass, then, and they put the patient on ECMO, then you go to DRG, it's 003. And the reimbursement for that right now, depending on your, where you're from, where you live, there's variability in, 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 in the CMS reimbursement, but in, in some locations, it's around $147,000 plus or minus, with some variability to that. But you lose the DRG for the heart surgery. Okay. You don't get both. Mm -hmm. right. Now, it's broken down into, I believe it's 28 units, with the first day being two units. And it, there's a requirement to keep the patient a certain period of time. I'm not exactly sure how long that is. But if you ship the patient within a window of time, you keep the two, uh, the two unit initiation because you did spend the money and the resources and the, the equipment and the, the, the disposables and all the things that go along with that. And then when you transfer the patient, the receiving agency starts from day one again. They get two uh -huh. units and they just start from like scratch. Yeah. But there's a window in which that has to happen. It can't happen at day 28. So or day 26. There's a, there's a financial um, incentive? incentive to to put patients on ECMO in remote areas and then and then move them a few days later to an ECMO center. 
right? Well, which is I fine. think that it's, it's it it is structured in a way that if you do it, it won't it won't cripple right. you financially. Is it financially rewarding to just do that and not have an actual ECMO program where you have those patients which you lose money on and those patients that you earn money on? No, I would say not. I would say if you're it, and if you're in a small community area and you're putting patients on ECMO frequently, I would say your program's probably not too good. I know. So I, I don't know that that right. really work. You know, yeah. I don't know what you think, Suzanne, but that's what I think. I wouldn't want to chime in just a little bit on what he was saying. I don't, it, when you say it out loud, you're like, it, it, oh yeah, we'll, we'll put them on and then we'll transfer them. You got to remember you're putting somebody on and they still got to be accepted somewhere, even if you're the same hospital system, Memorial Herman Wordlands versus the medical center. Because you can say, oh, man, we're going to put them on two days. We just made $146,000. Now we send them out. Because what's going to happen is you're going to call that physician. He's, you're going to tell him the patient's comorbidities and what's going on. He's going to say, no, we, we can't accept the patient. Now your community hospital is stuck with that bill. Mm -hmm. So I don't foresee them doing that. If anything, at best, you're, you know, there's always exceptions, especially in the OR. But if you've you got a sick patient that's going to crap out sooner than later, you're going to make that phone call to the big center and say, listen, we got a guy that... This is him. We're considering ECMO, uh, and then they're going to say, you know what? Yeah, go ahead and put him on, and then you get him, and then stabilize, and then we're going to transfer him in. Because if it's a bad patient, it's a bad patient. There's only so much we can do. And you know, these guys go in there, and they're very good at what they do. They're gonna the first thing they're thinking of when they say we want to put him on ECMO is, well, what's the end outcome? If it's a cancer patient, if it's 93 years old patient that needs a new heart or new lungs that will not ever be listed, you're not going to put him on. So there's a lot of limitations, a lot of thought process that goes through. Okay, I need to remind everybody to subscribe. Um, I was just told I have to remind everybody to hit subscribe on the, uh, on the YouTube. So I, there's 18. I want to see 18 subscriptions right now. <laughs> and I'm going to call Kim back. Kim called, but now she's not calling us. So that could be that she got called in to do a case. I mean, who knows what's happened. So we're gonna, I'm going to place a call. <laughs> This has never happened. Yeah. Well, you know what? This is the first, yeah, time, for first time for everything. First time Absolutely. for everything. Absolutely. We're on the edge here. We live on the edge, right Right on the edge. We're just ready right. to fall off the cliff yeah. at any given moment. And why is it not happening, uh, Roger? What's going on? It's not ringing. Create. No. Oh, because I have to hit the button that says call. I got it. I'm a perfusionist, okay? <laughs> it's just relax, man. Relax. Everybody stand down. Stand down. <laughs> Hello. Kim. Yes, hi. We've been waiting for you to call in. <laughs> I'm just watching. We have suspended all activity until we heard from you, and, and, and uh, uh, well, so we decided to call you. Okay. <laughs> so, what do you think? Well, um, I work currently at a place that is an ECMO center. We do about 75 adult ECMOs a year or more. That's a lot. That's a lot. That is a lot. Ours is a nursing-based watched program. So you have nurse, With, nurse ECMO specialists or well, the nurse at the bedside? No, it's the nurse at the bedside, and we have ECMO doctors, you know, um, that take care of the patients in round. We have nurse practitioners there in that unit. There are what they call ECMO champions that are nurses that um, are available. And then we do training and in a simulation lab for respiratory to help transport. What simulator do you use? No, no, not a simulation like for, for that. It's in, a, it's in a simulation lab. It's um, where we just practice things. We have like the, we bring our equipment in and there's the dummy person, you know, and we practice how to transport. Oh, okay. It, it's not, it's not like a sim, like to put somebody on bypass or I anything. I gotcha, 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 gotcha. Yeah. So, so, so are you able to tell us, Kim, where you're from or, or, or do you want to um, keep that confidential tonight? No, I'm in Hershey Medical Center in Hershey, oh, Pennsylvania. Okay. Oh, yeah. very good. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, we, we're going to, we're all expecting some chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now I've only been there a couple years and, uh, I did, 
I was working 20 some years uh, in Harrisburg, which is close by, which we started an ECMO program there, which we were perfusion sitting at the bedside, which was horrible. With staffing was uh, bad. Well, you know, it's, so, it's, yeah, it's, 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 and Suzanne, I mean, everybody here, I'd like to, to, to get your thoughts about this. Look, I mean, we have the same issue. I don't think that we are any more, any, any more unique or, or have any different stresses when it comes to epidemics. In fact, I'm working on a, on a, on a presentation right now, the title of which is, we are one epidemic away. And mm -hmm. were it not for the relationships that I have with people like Chris and other folks, you know, Patrick and several other people in the Med Center area who can help supplement our right. staff. It's a resource. As a, yes, as a Absolute business, we would, we, would be, we would fail because we would not either be able to mat take care of the patients or mm -hmm. we would not be able to do hearts the next day and this latest episode with this you know latest virus h2n3 i think it is is what they classified mm -hmm. i guess that's what they called it um mm -hmm. we had uh we were we were basically one patient away well and suzanne from, had the experience of actually not uh so not you, being able to do surgery yeah we were one they patient they away anybody. they called us for ecmo and i was talking with our manager and she told me she said joe if we put this in we do not have enough people to work tomorrow. I mean, that was the, that was where, and, and they ended up not putting the ECMO in, which, you know, but I mean, that's, that's cutting it awfully tight. But then that ended, and now I'm, if I'm sitting here with, you know, I, I, we have, right now we are, we have an abundance of staff right now. It's really good for the, for the staff. They're very happy. They're having, they're getting a break. They're getting a breather. Um, it's the yin and the yang. But if I had to staff for an Armageddon circumstance, I, the company will not survive. It's, it's just as simple as that. We had to have, at one point before we actually had the program, we had to have nightly conversations with the chair of cardiac surgery. What can you cover? I mean, because we were covering three hospitals with, you know, on average between 12 and 14 perfusionists and doing lung transplants, heart transplants. So, I mean, there were times where we were having nightly discussions prior to implementing the, um, you know, full-blown program with the RTs about what cases can we do the next day. Yeah, no, I mean, that, that's, I mean, I know exactly. And that's, that's almost Canadian style medicine. You know, that's, that's, <laughs> no, it is. It really is. That happens in, yeah. in, 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 in those Canada, programs. Right. I mean, it just does, it's a right. reality. You know, it yeah. doesn't mean that it's wrong, it's bad, it's just the way it, it's just the way it is. Basically, yeah, uh, if you're healthy enough to not have surgery tomorrow, you're not having surgery tomorrow. Yeah. Right. Right, exactly. And you're not an emergency. They're going to take care of the emergencies, but, you know, if you're an elective procedure, it, it, mm -hmm. you're just going to have to wait, you know, and that's all there is to it. And depending on your staffing and pay structure for your staff, you know, you run into huge issues. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, that's that and you bring up Ray Kim. I want to know your your thoughts about this, too, is 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 that. So well, you, you have you have the people you're you're watching the ECMOs, you're 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 needing help. You're in Hershey, Pennsylvania, or you're in Houston, Texas or you're in, um, uh, at Emory, or, or maybe not Emory, where you may be right now, somewhere in Iowa, I don't know. <laughs> but now you need help, Iowa. and there are, n everybody, every, she's keeping it secret, Suzanne is keeping it secret. <laughs> yeah. I've been trying Very to close tell, to the vest. I've been trying to figure out where the blinds are from and the, and yeah. the, and the color on the wall. I'll, I'll, we'll figure it out eventually. It's Iowa, yeah. It's, is it Iowa? Yeah. You're in Iowa? Iowa, no, it's no. completely not Iowa. Okay. Oh. Right. Well, it could be Green Bay. You're wearing green, but no. In all seriousness, so so you need help, but everybody in your state is also in the same position. So you need maybe there's another area where it's not so bad, and there are people available, but you can't get them licensed, mm -hmm. and then worse, you can't get them licensed. So you get an emergency 
decree and they get a license, you know, because they had one from the, from, from the Pope. But then the hospital won't credential them. Correct. Mm -hmm. So now you have that process to go through. Now you have to get emergency privileges. You know, and, and, and by the time all of that happens, the patient has either gotten better or something else has happened, transferred or whatever. So how do you, Kim, how do you deal with that? Well, I don't have to deal with that at the hospital I work now, but where I worked before, I worked for the same company that did your Thomas Jefferson paper. So oh. it was a national company, and uh, hmm. they pulled people from all over. So I had a lot of people credentialed. I had per diem help. It never interfered with the um, current OR schedule because the surgeon wouldn't allow it to stop. Wait, mm -hmm. Kim, so did, did that's you... how we did it. It was not fun. And, right. uh, you know, we'd work 30 some days in a row and it was horrible. Oh, yeah. People burned out and people left and looked for greener pastures. But Kim, did you say that you, you worked for the perfusion contracting company that was involved with the Jefferson University yes. study? Oh, yes. that's yeah, great. That's what she said. <laughs> I know. That's really cool. I'm so happy you called. <laughs> or well, we called you. They would pull yeah. us to you. Philadelphia, you. you know, yeah. and when things got short there, we would get pulled to Philly or, you know, that's how they do it. They have people Oh, I know who from... you work for now. I don't know who you went to Philly. <laughs> I know. You went to Hup, didn't you? No, I didn't go to Hup, oh. uh, but I didn't have to go there. I was in... Um, Press? Oh, Temple. Temple. Oh, at Temple. Well, same, it was the same yeah. group. It was the same group. Same group, I, yeah. Yes, I same know group. it was. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. so I, yeah. you know, I used to work, I, I was at Hub. Oh, were from, you? Okay. Yes, I was. From 19, 1983 to 1980, 1983 to 1986. Oh, I was okay. at Hub. Yeah, okay. that was a heck, that was an experience. So did you know, yeah. Paul, did you know Paul Adonisio? Dr. Anisio? No. Uh, Anisio. No. no, you didn't know him? No, no uh-uh. No. It might be, it's probably before your time, Kim. Well, I've been around a long time, too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I've yeah. heard that a lot. So, yeah. okay, so we have another, we have another question, okay? This mm -hmm. question is um, from Vicki, who is a CRNA in Alexandria, Louisiana. She says... I do, uh, why do they require a master's degree to run the heart-lung machine, but a small certification course for a mini heart-lung machine? True. So I'm really not sure, Vicki, in this case, uh, that uh, they don't require a master's I think a bachelor's is the... Yeah, uh, I'm just yeah bachelor's. that's, yes. Huh? No, most programs are master's now. Most I mean, are. Just master, most master. are. Okay, most are now. Yeah. But there are a lot of perfusionists today that right. are practicing that, that, that are doing it with a bachelor's and some less. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So that are still left. Right. Older people like me. OJT. Yeah. OJT, but they yeah. still pass the boards. Exactly. But Sears, they got it from Sears. So that was good. Yeah. But I passed the boards exactly three times. All right. So the question is, let me, add, let's start with, let's start with Suzanne. Suzanne, why do we need a, at least a bachelor's and, and now today a master's, but yet a person can run it with just a certification course. But I, I don't, again, I don't, Vicki, I think the concern is that it's a nurse, so she's going to have at least a, an associate's degree in nursing, but have nurse an RN. She's going to have that license and <laughs> respiratory therapy. They are, a, are they a bachelor's? Oh, no, it's still, um, junior, you can still have an associate degree for RN or RT. Uh, to answer Vicky's question, I think um, you got to remember they're not requiring a bachelor's or a master's degree to run ECMO. They're requiring that to be a perfusionist. So these people that are running the ECMO or watching these specialists that are at the bedside, they're not going to the OR running the heart lung bypass. And so that's kind of where the breakdown is. You know, a perfusionist can do it all in regards to heart lung bypass, ECMO, transport, etc. And these other guys, these like the the study that she did, the program where she's at, where nursing does it. They're at the bedside, and that's it. I mean, but, they're doing their specialty, but they're at the bedside. But Chris, so that's she's the difference. calling it a mini heart lung machine, the ECMO. It, it is, but you got to remember, they're not inserting it, they're not taking it out, they're only managing it. Mm -hmm. And so, 
again, they're not requiring the degree to manage it. They're requiring the degree to be a perfusionist to do all the things. Kim, is that your, your experience in program also where you are um, inserting it, you're, 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 you know, you're putting it in, you're doing the first several hours, you're available on call, but the nurses are watching it. And then you're also there for the, uh, you know, the, the final phases of the weaning process, or is it something different? Well, it's a little different. We're there for insertion, but there are the nurse practitioners that could do it without, you know, they can do it if we're not available because there's ECMO specialist doctors there. Oh. And um, we do not stay with it any time. We are on call if they need us, but mm -hmm. we don't do, sit any shifts or anything mm -hmm. with it. So the physicians that you're saying are, are, are special ECMO trained, where are yes. they getting that special ECMO training? The one is there now. It came from Germany. Okay. Um, and trained there. There's there's three or four of them that are there. Um, that they, you know, there's somebody in house or around all the time. Um, so there's always a physician in house. So that's good. Because where I worked before, we would be sitting bedside, and there wasn't even a cardiac PA in house. We were the only ones sitting. Kim, I have a question for you. Uh, earlier, you said that you uh, basically you would get staffing um, if you couldn't cover, so you didn't you know interrupt your surgical schedule. Now, when you right. say you got staffing, I'm sure it was perfusion, but was it ECMO experienced perfusionist, or is it just a perfusionist? Ah, that's a good question. Well, I would say most of them had experience, yes, because they came from other, um, you know, fairly close hospitals that, because they had to be credentialed at ours, um, mm -hmm. so they were within a 100-mile radius, they would come. But did you hear how many ECMOs they were doing? Mm -hmm. The so reason, that mm -hmm. was that was a yeah. very wise business decision. Mm -hmm. Right. They, they could do it because they could afford to do it given the, 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 the volume, the sheer volume mm -hmm. of ECMO that they were doing. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that, that's, a, that's what you're describing is a really, really, really robust and, and the other thing is, you know. Well, that's, see, that's not here. That's not where my current job is. Yeah, no, no the previous where you one. Were, previous. Where I worked right. before, where I was before, we did a, like a dozen a year. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't as big as where I am now. This gotcha. is a definitely bigger. It, you know, this is a VAD center. It's a transplant center where I'm at now. So they, they get a lot of things shipped in as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, the other but question is, the did, other did was they the local, you know, community hospitals, the three of them that were there. Mm -hmm. So uh, the other question I had for you is whenever you said they covered it or you guys, you had a lot of turnover and people were burnt out. Was there incentive mm -hmm. offered to watch these, or was it just expected as your part of your salary? No, they paid extra for shift. Okay. And it's just like the Philadelphia market; they got paid extra to go there. Because what, what like we're if running, I wanted to make extra money, I mm -hmm. could go there for go the weekend. Up. Okay. Because uh, what we run into a lot of, with a lot of these programs, and I've experienced it personally, is that you now you have these nursing-based programs, or let's just call them ECMO specialist programs, where at the end of the day, perfusion is still in charge of it, but not monitoring, not bedside, um, and you lose all your revenue from that. It goes to nursing services. So not only do you not mm -hmm. have any incentive to want to go watch that, uh, you don't get anything for it, nor does your department get anything for it. But that's mm -hmm. poor structuring. I don't necessarily think it has to be that way. Um, you know, I think it can be a win-win situation. Now, what it will affect is perhaps the number of people that you have on staff. No one wants to lose their job, but you may not grow your staff. So you may not mm -hmm. lose a position, but you're not going to add a position. And I think that the insertion portion of it, I think that the initial uh, stabilization of it, I think that the rounds part of it, I think that the call out for troubleshooting part of it, I think that all of those things, can be a source of both revenue for the organization and uh, 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 and we'll call it bonus pay, if you will, for the clinician that goes and does it. But I I'll tell you this, and you're, you know, of, of the people that I know, and I, I, and I used to pride myself on being the hardest working guy around. But I have to say, you know, Chris, you, you, you really do 
impress me with your intestinal fortitude when it comes to it's not true. sleeping it's and working. True. You're the hardest working right. person, I think, a perfusionist of any, or, or just person in general that I've ever known in my life. But you can't do that forever. No. It can't. will end. Okay. Correct. I mean, you're, what, 22, <laughs> right? right? <laughs> and, uh, exactly you know, exactly. and you're already gray and you've got yeah. the little, you know, bags yeah, right. under your eyes. You need the plexiderm. That's it. But, you know, so you can't do it forever. And so, you know, life and our profession is a marathon. And I think that we, you know, we, we have to figure out a way to do this where our quality of life is balanced to the amount of money that we're making. Mm -hmm. And I don't necessarily think it is an unwise thought to say how, what else can we add to our toolbox that can bring us additional revenue without having to be up for 36 hours, 42 hours, 48 mm -hmm. hours, managing these patients at the bedside. I don't necessarily, I think that's working hard, not necessarily working smart. I mean, and, and, and you know, just to throw some stuff out there in the little bit of time we have left, there's angiovac procedures, right. mm -hmm. there's CRRT. Uh, Kim, you mentioned it. I know that you mentioned it as well, Suzanne. You know, I believe the patient goes on ECMO, they should be on CRRT immediately. Whether or not their kidneys are working doesn't make any difference to me. I think that it has so many additional benefits uh, to get rid of inflammatory maybe. media. I mean, that's what I believe. You know, you and I disagree on that. I will disagree on that because and, if you have a healthy patient with healthy kidneys, uh, a lot of times when you take over for them, now you're stunning those kidneys. See, and I don't agree with that at all. So that's going to be our, listen, everybody, we're going to be planning this debate. It's going to be <laughs> Luzby v. Basha happening right yeah. here. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that I think we need to have that discussion because, but you have that, you have TCD, transcranial Doppler. Mm -hmm. Should that not be a standard of care for every ECMO patient, for every patient who goes on cardiopulmonary bypass, for, uh, you know. Anybody uh, on heparin therapy should have something like that. Exactly, not, not, not BIS, well BIS is a different animal, but yeah. not, not cerebral oximetry, I'm talking TCD. Those are also revenue generating uh, things mm -hmm. that we can do that are reimbursable. I think we need to think outside of the box mm -hmm. on how do we increase our value, increase our, our, our reimbursements, our revenue, what value we bring to the hospital, how we increase our salaries and not have to be up to all hours of the night losing time with your family, not having, you know, your kids are already, you're, you've got one kid in college already, I know, <laughs> no. and you probably don't even know the poor kid's name. No. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I mean, you know, look, if you miss every holiday, you, I mean, it's terrible. And it is, it is, it is exhausting and it is unhealthy for us to mm -hmm. be doing that. So is there a better way to do this and make it so that it's a win, a win, 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 win situation. It's a win first for the patient. That has to be the primary focus for us as clinicians. It's a win for the hospital. It's a win for us. Uh, it's a win for our profession. Mm -hmm. It's a win for the other clinicians in the hospital. Um, you know, and I, of course, I believe that collaboration is the is the end all, be all of improving outcomes. I think individually, we can all do a lot of things to make things better, but it's very incremental. When you want to make big leaps and bounds of improving outcomes, improving patients' quality of lives, improving, uh, decreasing morbidity, whatever it may be, it has to be a collaborative effort. It, mm -hmm. it, it, it truly takes a village. So those are my final thoughts. Final thoughts? No, that's absolutely correct. I mean, it, it does take that village. You know, it's, it, it's got to be a collaborative effort. And it's really got to be geared towards the patient. I mean, that's, that's what we're in the business for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that uh, if ECMO is going to grow the way we, we foresee it coming to grow, the only way to handle it is for us to get ahead of it as perfusionists and, and manage the process by training other people and, and collecting that retainer <laughs> that, was, that was in the pre presentation mm -hmm. that I showed for the first one you know, to be in front of it and to be the trainers and the teachers and the managers of the circuit, but not sitting there watching at bedside. Because if it's gonna grow, and if we can't cover it in that way, we'll lose it. We will lose it. Right. I agree with that. Chris? Um, you know, at the end of the day, I think uh, 
clearly I put the patient before anything. I don't look at any cost. However, I think our biggest way to generate revenue is not to give anything away. You know, you can say what can we bill for next or what new services can we do, but let's just not give away what we've been trying to do. Mm-hmm. And just like uh, Vicki that called in, you know, said mini bypass is exactly what it is. Thing, the thing that we go to school for to do in the OR is what we're doing in the ICU now. Don't give it away. Because if that's the case, then why not train the nurse just to go into OR and pump just a simple case? You know, right. give them a few weeks of training. Oh, you know what? And give them a closed system while you're at it. Mm-hmm. So that way they have something to do. Mm-hmm. I had another question, too. But let me get these final thoughts. And, 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 I, and I apologize. I hope you don't mind. But we do have just a few minutes. But Susanna, what's your final thoughts? And then we're going to go to Kim. The reimbursement's not going to stay as high as it is. And I think that needs to be taken into account. It's come down Moving already. To, it's come you, down already. You've got that, uh, you know, forward thinking about that. It's just not going to stay as high as it is. Mm-hmm. That's a very good, very good point. Uh, 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 Kim, some final thoughts? Yes. Well, I agree. I think I think to, when the insurance catches up with it, um, it is going to go down. Uh, I think our program does pretty well with a with a nurse base, and we're on call. I think they do a very good job with it. It's very well structured and very well run. So, for me, coming from twenty four sit hours sitting at the bedside to this, this is so much better uh, as a lifestyle for me. I and I haven't seen any issues. They've been, you know, our circuit's very simple. It's in and out, and um, so it's very easy. Mm. So I, I'm happy with it. I think it's done well where I am. Mm. Before I think, we leave, I, go ahead, Suzanne. I think you have to take into account, just like Kim said, what is your circuit, what is the safety of your circuit, and you know the whole difference of managing it versus uh, sitting with it. I think those mm. are two right. totally different yeah, things. Good point. Yeah. yeah. I had a, that's the a very, that's an excellent yeah. point. Um, I, I had one question. I just want to take a quick poll before I make my clo- quick closing remarks. And, and uh, Kim, I want to start with you. In your ECMO circuit, do you have any access on the negative, on the access side, the negative side of the pump? Um, just where you prime it is all. And then you... cl- it's closed off. And then that it's closed gets off once we prime. Mm-hmm. S- Suzanne? Well, it's capped off. Capped no. off. No access on the negative no. side at all. No. We did not access. Yes, we, yes, we do. We uh, we run a manifold coming off, so we have uh, positive. We have access on both sides. Uh, actually, one for labs, but we also um, give volume that way through blood tubing, and we also um, use that for CRT access. And it mm-hmm. seems to work better than that, you know, a Quentin or something because. Now you got to stick flows. the patient. You got to well, right. you have to stick the patient. They get finicky. Yeah. They get but off. The, the only problem that we have with the CRT when it regards to that is a volume issue. If the patient's having trouble with volume, uh, then your CRT is not going to work. But at the end of the day, we see better results with that mm-hmm. because uh, we, we having do... the access in the pump because you have correct more consistent. You have the right. less interruption of, of therapy therapy correct. when you're doing CRT. And of course, you know Patrick, our, our, yes, our, you know our ours circuit. does. Our it's sense. a debate we're having. And I think that with perfusionists there at the bedside, having access on the negative side of the pump, which is where the disaster will happen when the stopcock gets turned the wrong way, right. it only takes is one time. a reason yeah. Yeah. why you don't want that there if it's a nurse respiratory therapist driven program. Yeah. Um, you know, because even if, if we do it, if we, even if we do, were to do that, we can't fix it either. Right. Okay. Yeah. It's not mm-hmm. fixable. You just don't do it. You just don't do it. Um, yeah. And that's that's uh, that is a conundrum that we have not been able to sort of mm-hmm. reconcile with our circuit. And if this does end up transitioning, because it just ends up, the hospitals are going to demand it. That's my my major my that's my major mm-hmm. concern. It's interesting you bring that up because in the Jefferson study that we've been talking about, they they made a point, and I didn't quite get why, but they said we made a change to our circuit. And there was no access to the venous or arterial side. It mm-hmm. was simply a circuit. Yeah, and and a lot. Well, the simply cardio help is made that way. There's no access. You have to cut it in. Yeah, we do. We cut ours in. We get our pump pack the, pre-assembled, then we still cut it in before we uh, set it up and prime it. Right. The old cardiac, uh, 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 what's it called? Cardiac assist. It's called something else. Now, what do I keep wanting? Tandem life. The tandem life is the same way. It has tandem no, lung. It so has it no has access. no. So here's. I'm, I have experience with that as well. 
And so what happens is if you have the actual tandem lung setup, which is a Protec Duo cannula with a built-in oxygenator, I'm not fond of those because you're, there's so many parameters that aren't available. You can't measure anything going out in regards to pressure of your oxygenator. Mm -hmm. However, what you can do is uh, cut in a Quadrox uh, in, in your tandem circuit, pull your uh, cannulas back slightly to put them in the right position. Now that works. Um, but again, mm -hmm. when you do these things like this, is it an ECMO? Does it work? Absolutely. But the way we like to monitor and give the patient the best of, the, of our abilities, we want to know what's going on with that. Mm -hmm. Because it may be oxygenating, but it also may be throwing clots or getting ready to clot off. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know how to change that at 3 o'clock in the morning, mm -hmm. there's a problem. Right. Because a lot of these patients, and she has experience, I know this, when they have no reserve, they have no reserve, especially in your lung patients. And so when you're not oxygenated, their saturation is going to drop immediately, and that's it. Mm -hmm. You don't get a second chance. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying that, again, those RTs, nurses, doctors, anybody can't change these and be skilled at it. But if they're not used to doing that, then that's where you're going to run into that's a problem. Danger. Yeah. That's a very good point. Well, unfortunately, all, th all good, now, Kim, don't hang up, but all good things must, must come to an end. Um, I'm going to have to give my quick closing remarks. So, Kim, I wanted to first tell you thank you so much for accepting my telephone call today. <laughs> um, since you you're weren't welcome. calling us, I decided to call you. Suzanne, thank you for taking time out of your evening to spend time with us and, and, and give us your experience. I think it was extremely worthwhile from both you and Kim uh, from a remote perspective. And I think that's really something that that, that I, I'm proud of in the, in the uh, system over here, this, this studio, this webinar studio that Roger has put together from a technological, Roger is our multimedia director and he's the one who has created this system that enables us to do this very advanced technological capability of remote Skyping, remote telephone, and it all comes across, uh, uh, I think, really beautifully. So my compliments to Roger. He stays in the back. He never gets in front of a camera. He's very introverted and very quiet. But one day, hopefully, I'll be able to get him up here so that you can actually see who he is. Mm -hmm. Oh, don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Roger just told me in my ear. Make sure you hit the subscribe button. Also, if you have a topic that you would like for us to discuss yeah. and find faculty that can speak about it in a very um, eloquent and informed manner. Send me some emails, put it, on, put it on the YouTube, put it on the little comment section or whatever. I'm gonna read these things and we can uh, 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 bring to you things that really interest you. So make sure you do that. Uh, if you want to be part of the faculty, you have a great presentation or a great, uh, you can even show slides. So we have that capability as well. Please don't hesitate to approach me, contact me, and let me know. This format, look, I, I think that the reality of finances with hospitals taking reimbursements away, um, I, I, with smaller programs that they don't have enough people. Well, we, what do you, we can't do an ECMO, but you want to go to a meeting, we can't operate. And, and I think that, you know, we have to have something that is really good. You know, if you can't go to the meeting, how do you take the time off from work to sit at home for the week while the meeting's going on to do the live webinar? <clears throat> you know, what happens is you miss most of it and, mm -hmm. and, and we all do really want to learn. We're all consummate professionals. Absolutely. I think that's going to be very important. I wanted to also thank my incredible uh, panel for this evening. I mean, all you three gentlemen did just an incredible job, and I can't thank all of you enough. Mm -hmm. And then we have camera operators, David and Magic. We have the sound engineer, Stephanie. Uh, you know, this has been, a, a, a just for me, a, an extremely rewarding experience. And uh, I just want to thank everybody and thank all of you who stayed with us and watched and hopefully learned something. So next week, uh, not next week, I'm sorry, March 10th, is our next scheduled webinar, and it happens to be on RAP versus ultrafiltration, which is a debate. I think I'm debating. No, I actually, debate? it's Nate. Nate, Nathan. I'm debating Nate. And uh, the second is on safety, and I think these are really going to be two inc really good, incredible topics. So please get involved. We'd love to see you there. Don't forget March 10th. I'll send out the emails. You might have even gotten a flyer in the mail from me which talks a little bit about PerfWeb. Um, go on our website, take a look at that. 
And we're two minutes over, so with that, I'm going to bid you all adieu. Have a good evening, and thank you again for your time. Good night.